Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Type History, the podcast. So should I uh, just, you know, should maybe I use a rock and rock and roll DJ voice right here? I've never really been in on a radio. <laughs> or perhaps could I go old school, like the Mid-Atlantic Newsreel, early announcer voice, you know, whichever voice you wanted me to do, I could. <laughs> no. No, t- tell us about yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. My name is Devin Graney, and I'm a freelance writer and photographer. I've been doing freelance for quite a while, and I, I really like a variety of doing a variety of different articles. One of my interests is uh, old Memphis. I think we're kind of a, I think we have kind of an interesting history to us. Grew up in Memphis. Uh, I lived in Austin, Texas for 14 years. Went to the University of Memphis. Uh, studied journalism. Really didn't do much with it, but I, I put, picked up freelance writing about 2000 when I was still in Austin and been doing a lot of writing since. When I, I you write about various his, historical things. Uh, today, I'm really interested in learning about ghost signs. Mm-hmm. First of all, what are ghost signs? <laughs> They're signs that, that no longer really serve a purpose. And a lot of people are very pure to you know, say, well, it's got to be a certain age or it's got to be, you know, a sign that was covered up for years and a building was knocked down or a billboard removed. And now the, the years later, it's been uncovered. I like to think of any older sign. I'm just a little bit curious about what the story is behind it. There, there's so many of them in Memphis and in so many parts of the area. One sign I wrote about recently, I mean, the store just closed two years ago, but I found it interesting because the shopping center uh, had changed so much during the years. 20 years ago when it opened in 1997, this is over on Winchester, okay. that it's almost all abandoned. So I found an old shoe car- carnival sign. You may have seen that in the article. That's mm-hmm. not a, you know... A shoe carnival who cares you know it's not like an old coca-cola sign on south maine or anything but i just find it interesting because it it shows the change in the area in the retail environment um in just 20 years if the shopping center was a was a person it wouldn't be even a, be able to buy alcohol yet but on the other hand i like to find some really old signs signs that are you know they've been painted years and years ago and sometimes they're gone um you know the building gets knocked down a few of them remain i i just saw one just yes or I, I, yeah it's just yesterday when i was just doing a walk downtown kind of behind south main an old coca-cola sign five cents which you know it'd be kind of fun to find the history of that one so i always thought of ghost signs as having to be really old and you're saying they don't necessarily have to be really old well that's my definition i'm certainly not webster here but i well would... you're you're the webster today for memphis type history so <laughs> I think just, in my opinion, I think just about any sign that is, it it no longer serves its purpose. Okay. Some may find that kind of boring, uh, you know, a sign that's really not that old. Another interest of mine is looking at the history of downtown. Right. I don't know if you saw this or not, but I did kind of a timeline of things downtown, and that kind of helps me zero in on when some places were there and some weren't. So what got you into finding these ghost signs, learning about them, digging into the history, writing about them? What really sparked that interest? One is just kind of an interest in local history. Uh, two is just kind of a, just a curiosity of what's there. What's, what's the story behind that place that, you know, you pass by. Um, and I, I think, also, back in, in 86, I remember it was in 1986, I visited with a friend at Evergreen and Poplar. There was a business that was knocked down, and it uncovered an old Dr. Pepper sign, and it said, Pepper up 10 to and 4 o'clock, and then a buy war bonds little painting on the end that my friend said, hey, better take a picture of it now. And, you know, I was a photojournalism major at the time, so I got lots of pictures of the sign. And it was just really intriguing, this thing that had been 
covered up for to me seem like ancient times and the 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 resources that are available and to look for signs and you know just kind of going in and looking at it and when other people may be just a little curious you know you actually find out what the story is on it when you're looking at a sign and you want to know you know what is the story behind it what is that process like? How do you go about figuring it out? There's a little detective work that you do. You you kind of get an idea of the age of the building. And now this is not a perfect, my buddy Joe Lowry would be the first one to tell you this, a perfect way of looking at it is you can look at the Shelby County Assessor's website and get a rough idea on when the building was built. Another thing I will do is I will go, that gives me kind of a baseline, you know, I'll go to the city directories. And that's not always particular. If it said, you know, the building was opened in 1920 and it said Aitland's Dry Goods Sundry or something on there or something, you know, that would be, you know, I find out that Caitlin owned the place from 1921 and closed it in 25. You know, then you've got an idea when the sign is. But you might also have an ad on the side of your building of uh, Pepsi or something like that, that, that's not as exact science. But some you can really date very closely based on looking at the city directories and when somebody was there. Do you know much about, I imagine you do, but can you talk a little bit about, for an older ghost sign, like maybe one we would see painted downtown on a building, very fady, peely, whatever, um, what would that have looked like to make? Back in the day and like today, let's say a business starts, somehow they get a logo designed, you know, and then that logo comes from a computer and gets put to a sign shop and they cut the letters. And but back then, I mean, there weren't graphic designers making logos and sending them to sign shops in the same kind of way. So what would the relationship between the sign and the business have been back then? That's a, that's some kind of a multitude of, of questions, and I guess the best way <laughs> to think about it is one company, Bolton Signs, is still in business, and you can look at a lot of these old signs and see where Bolton is. And I have a, a buddy on Facebook I've known for quite a few years, uh, Bill Goodwin. He and his dad used to paint signs. And pretty much it was, yeah, they just did old school design back in like the, the 80s or so where they had an outline and then they painted in and occasionally I see, you know, he'll post a picture on Facebook of, one, you know, signs and, you know, my my dad pe- and I painted that in 85 and it's, uh, and it's still up there. In terms of the other thing you had you really didn't have a lot of sign ordinances back then and or you know restrictive covenants where the sign can't be too big or can't be too multicolored or whatnot and as far as i know it was just kind of a marketing free for all and you marketed your business the best you could though a lot of things have changed just kind of the culture you you know you had a lot of these small time uh you know these little bitty corner stores just about everybody had a corner store literally on the corner we would call a convenience store today but that's where you'd go shopping uh even in memphis are you able to see trends in these ghost signs were there trends and like what the design of them look like for different time periods anything like that that's a good question um i see that someone had told me i don't have anything really to base this on is that you had the old lead paint that just really could withstand the the test of time of course lead's toxic so i'm really not complaining that it's gone occasionally you'll see something you know like a very old school calligraphy type writing there's a place on north main you could use you see like an old type of shirt collar uh within the ad which usually you just kind of see the you know, that name itself, but as an illustration, you could tell it was kind of old. It's sort of encased in glass and has stairs to it as well. Then some of the signs, you know, they're just purely informational. Uh, they may have been covered up by something. And my, my first ghost sign article was uh, in the Memphis Downtowner back in, I believe it was 2008. And there was a place where, you know, SOB south of Beale is right now. And apparently it must have been a billboard in the way. 
and it was just it was a church saying called holiness is beautiful or something and it turned out to be an old church uh like a a mission for the for the poor in the 20s and 30s and sadly it's gone now it's now tables where the uh at the facility in in terms of trends i'm trying to think of some example a lot of the old you know coca-cola signs uh are around some are designed better than others some you would look at and say gosh that must go way back when and there was one over on a broad avenue district where i was thinking gosh that's that looks like a really old sign it was only from like the early 90s and this was 10 years ago when i wrote the article <laughs> oh so looking at the sign sometimes you get a sense of how old it is and and how it's not did that, did that answer your question? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to say, well, the postmodernist era ended in, you know, <laughs> or began in 1973. But, but. So it sounds like, I guess if you're really going to try to scientifically date one of these signs, you would have to do property research, business license type research, and then maybe also try to look at the physical paint or something like that. Like maybe if it was potentially an important sign. And another thing you look at is the... The Memphis room, you know, the uh, the fourth floor of the of the public library, and the special collection at the University of Memphis Library, also on the fourth floor, they have excellent clipping files. So you know our our you know Caitlin Sundry store I was talking about earlier, you know I might find some reference to it, or I might find some kind of uh, you know Caitlin such and such who lives so and so. And then also if you find a name, it's usually the Shelby County Register of Deeds has uh, just an incredible database. A lot of people probably don't even know it exists. It, it will have death certificates from Memphis up until I think, I want to say like maybe 1950, 1949, something like that. So I could find when such and such died or... The find a grave, of course, is the is the one a lot of the public uses. But that but there's other things that you could find. You know, you could cross reference if it's you know a relatively unusual name. In fact, it reminds me one of the signs I was looking for. This is one we were talking about. Was you mentioned the Hotel Pontotoc? That's an yeah. interesting ghost sign, right there. I found the article and then I I came across a reference in this article from the early 80s on the old Hotel Pontotoc about a uh, legend of somebody being burnt to death and uh, the fur and then I just you know, looked at the first name and cross-referenced a bunch of them and then I found yeah it looks like it was a true story yeah that one did seem to check out didn't it <laughs> I almost kind of didn't don't. want it to be you know it's kind of coolish <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah. I was just thinking, and there was another ghost sign story that I was, uh, I research, researched this for the downtowner. And uh, thank you again, uh, Terry Gorman, jo Jody Vance, for doing this because it sounded so artsy fartsy that I almost didn't suggest it. But they went with it. There's the Lamar Theater uh, over on Lamar, and it's been empty for since 1977 i went way i just i just really went into this to find there was a rumor that when the x-rated movie deep throat was playing in the 1970s there's even a documentary on it that some guys came into the theater and they said that they're with the video or the the movie company and that they were there for their collection and they refused to give it to them then they came back and they, they just said we'll be back and they and that night the theater burnt down and i looked and i looked i found out when that movie was playing i looked through the the newspapers to find something the vital anything about a fire from this theater that has been there since the 1920s couldn't find it i asked people from the fire museum yeah they don't remember anything about it i looked at the i sort of cross-referenced years and i looked at the theater the ads in the paper all I could tell is it stopped business in April of 1977. I didn't see any article about a fire. And if somebody says, oh, well, I remember it was a fire or something, I'll be the first to, to stand corrected. But I, I, I put a lot of research into that, trying to find if that were true. Because occasionally you'll hear 
you'll hear stories about signs. There was one, it's in an alley downtown. It was some kind of beauty school. I was taking a picture of it, and somebody said, oh, you know the story about that, don't you? I said, no, no, I don't. And I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want to get anything rumors started in case this isn't true. But it was a beauty school, and that a bunch of, you know, ladies would go in there uh, at the beginning of the day. Then a bunch of guys would show up afterwards, and then they, then they you know, that, that it kind of went that way until, you know, then the ladies went in, then a bunch of guys went in, then a bunch of other guys came in with Vice Squad all across their shirt, came in and rested it, and guys were coming out with wrapped in towels saying, don't tell my wife. And Oh, my. <laughs> and I looked, and I looked, and I looked for some kind of verification of that. I could not find it. I looked in files, prostitution, Memphis. I kind of remember there was sort of a big crackdown in the early 80s. I couldn't find any evidence of it. I wasn't about to do that in case... You know, that was actually owned by, I don't know, the the wife of the priest from Calvary Episcopal. And I would just get, you know, <laughs> the I, yeah. I, told, I told the people at the downtowner and they appreciated it. They wasn't going to, I wasn't going to run anything like that. Oh, man. It's so, it. I think it sounds pretty tough sometimes to try to separate, not really so strong as urban legends, but just like town lore about buildings and signs and then trying to figure out what the truth was and yeah that sounds like a challenge <laughs> yeah it is i wasn't about to you know i wasn't gonna do something you could say if such and such was a story or something like that but that there's something like that would be relatively recent and i didn't want to disparage the name if this is just some rumor that somebody remembered here of course you know if it's a bunch of powerful people they might have kept it out of the paper anyway so <laughs> who yeah, knows just man that's so interesting what has been if not one of these stories that you shared already what has been one of the more interesting paths you've ended up on in researching a sign i'm trying to think of some of the more interesting legends and I know the moment that we hang up is I'm gonna I'm gonna say <laughs> oh yeah what about some place oh well here's one uh, there's it's still visible on Madison between BB uh, King and second Goodman and Son jewelers uh, which it closed in 1989 and in fall of uh, 1989 I've, I found the articles on it in the I think in the Memphis room and it had opened in 1862. I mean, that place opened the year of the Battle of Memphis. Wow. And I mean, the sign obviously wasn't that old, but... Uh, yeah, but still, that's still pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the, the story, and it's... Um, they had a bunch of these local jewelers, and now, I, you know, Mednikau is still the, still the big one. Another plug to some of my friends. But, you know, this was such a, a piece of Memphis lore. Uh, for so long and another one I was kind of intrigued about was um, mostly with these ghost signs people have long since died and you find out where they were where they lived there's one over by Moe's Tacos and Garibaldi's Pizza on Walker right by the university and there was a there's a sign up there James Key's Bassoons which you know oh, who knew that Memphis was big enough to <laughs> to support a bassoon shop but uh, I actually got to find found James Keys. He's moved to uh, and still fixing bassoons out. I think in uh, near Nashville, and I talked wow. to him very briefly. What's the story behind it? Keys, uh, let's say, yeah, James Keys. He was a bassoonist for the Memphis Symphony Orchestra, and in the early '80s, and his former student Alvin Sweeney, they opened this uh, place they called the Woodwind Clinic, and. Then in uh, 1998, he moved out. So, you know, it was what I thought, found interesting about that was actually talking to somebody who was there, you know, you know, who was actually part of that ghost sign, you know, rather than, you know, that find out that he died in 75 or something. Yeah. And then another one, which was really interesting, was the uh, two other ones I found fascinating. There was the Firestone smokestack. And it was interesting there, not so much to say there used to be a place, a Firestone plant 
in Memphis. That area, I looked at the census tracts that kind of surrounded there, and I have to thank the University of Memphis Library. They've got a lot of old census information. And in 1970, you had uh, about 60,000 people living in those tracts, census tracts. In the 2010 census, 27,000. I mean, how, you know, the closing of this plant in 1983, and then two years later, their international harvester, how that just totally changed the nature of this neighborhood. I mean, Firestone used to be big. I mean, it wasn't as big as FedEx, but, you know, hearing somebody say they were, you know, let's say 40, 50 years ago was, you know, like say you work, I worked at International Harvester. It's like saying you work at FedEx or Methodist Hospital today or something. It's, they were just huge industries. And the fact that that area closed, and it's, it's like the whole area has never quite been the same since. Yeah, I'm looking to see, is this, is the housing area you're talking about, the census area, is that the one, it's like Belts Court? Is that the one that was built and then people typically worked at Firestone? I, I don't, I, I didn't find anything specifically about Belts Court. I was looking at the census tracks okay. around that area. I, I, I might have notes still about what track numbers they were, but the tracks they they kind of remain the same. They have might may like have track one hundred, one census. Then then it's broken into one hundred and track one hundred point one the next census. But you still have kind of the roughly the same boundaries. But just the fact that this area had lost half the people and that you know this was a a, a middle class neighborhood with a lot of uh, you know pretty good paying jobs back in the day. And, you know, those places just aren't around anymore or those kind of places. So interesting. Yes. Do you find that you end up off on a lot of rabbit trails into other things when you're researching or do you stay pretty like set on your specific point of interest? Microfilms, I've noticed, do that is that they have, you look like you've done some research. If you, the rule about microfilms is if you look at, go looking at a microfilm or something in the microfilm, you'll find something like 10 times more interesting, an article there on the way. And uh, But I was looking at one from November of uh, 79. I forgot what I was looking up. And I came across an article about a boy in 1904, an orphaned boy who was you know, a little mentally slow, who went to a fire station for help and the the guys took him in you know fed him and he stayed there and it was his obituary 75 years after living in a in fire stations wow i even emailed this to this american life i said now this is a this is your right up your alley but you just when you go into finding these uh you know going through uh, microfilms, you know, microfiches, you find these really interesting stories. I mean, that's what a lot of this is, I think, is like, you do go off on those, like, little moments of discovering something outside of what you were looking for, which I Mm -hmm. think, I mean, that adds so much flavor and so many layers to something in in the city and even the topic that you were originally looking into that I find so interesting about all of this <laughs> some signs they, they just really aren't that interesting you know when you really look at it i just couldn't find um you know one one it was across from the commercial appeal this this sign from an old liquor store and i, I put it in the downtowner article and it just really wasn't that interesting you know i found somebody whose family used to work there and you know remembered going to you know walking up near sun studios to eat lunch or something but that just wasn't interesting but not too far from there was uh was a restaurant that opened in 1982 and keep in mind it was in june of 82 is when graceland opened for tours and i mean Ah. i think it was literally that moment you know you could pretty much put the day that graceland opened for tours as the day when Memphis and tourism started being associated with each other. I mean, people really weren't interested in touring Memphis in 1981. 
I mean, no, right. no slight against Memphis back then, but it just wasn't really a big tour destination. And actually in 79, the uh, Sun Studios opened for tours. 82, that's when Graceland opened. And then just around the corner from Sun Studios, there was this old hotel, you know, World War I era. It had a couple different names. It was abandoned. It was cheap, you know, because downtown hadn't really taken off as a destination. And right. some people bought it and they said, I got an idea. We're going to turn this into, call it the Heartbreak Hotel, you know, the King's Heartbreak Hotel, because that name hadn't been, you know, and painted a guy who, yeah, techno 50 singer. Maybe he did kind of look sort of like a certain Memphis singer who did sing a song about Heartbreak mm -hmm. Hotel, but, you know, not enough for trademark. And they'd have a bunch of 50s memorabilia in there they had i think it was a cadillac is the salad bar it just sounded like it, it was just like a perfect thing i mean if you and i had money we would probably you know put put money into it and it opened in march of 83 it was gone before halloween and it was called the king's heartbreak wow. hotel and the sign is still up there you can still see it faded on the on the building where they they painted you know they would have painted in 82 but there was a lot of publicity going around it and somehow um hats off to people who make it in the restaurant business because it can't be easy wow yeah <laughs> well i i know um i saw the picture of that one and a couple other things we've talked about in some of your articles already and i just want to for the listeners i'm going to link up to all of this in the show notes which you can find at memphis type history.com slash ghost memphis type history.com slash ghost for the show notes um in case at this point you're starting to wonder where can i see all these pictures <laughs> They will be there. So when you're looking into the signs, at what point, like, what is your sense of like, this is interesting or not interesting? When, when do you make that call? Or what, what sorts of things are you looking for that show you this is an interesting sign? The ones that weren't really that interesting, that I still went ahead and published it, they were on kind of pretty busily trafficked streets. That's why I thought that, you know, there might have been something just because somebody said, oh, yeah, I've always noticed driving down Union, this this old liquor store sign. Yeah, I mean, it closed in 1998. This sign article came out in 2008, so it was only 10 years old then. But it just wasn't an interesting sign, you know, 636 Union. But the the fact that, you know, I figured a lot of people passed it. Maybe some people were curious. Uh, some of those ghost signs, you know, have gone away. There was the old Lawrence Furniture sign, uh, which is now the, the Washburn condos. I mean, it wasn't a particularly interesting sign. It was kind of, you know, a boarded up old building. And another one that really surprised me, this is a sign I hadn't mentioned, was the Hickman building, which is over on 248 Madison, and it's right across the street from the, the YMCA. So if you're, you know, on the treadmill at the Y downtown, you'll see it. This building, it closed in 1971. And I just figured it would be a bat roost until then. Almost was lost in a 1993 fire. But just this year, they started remodeling it. I mean, you talk about 1971, that's, that's 46 years that this place was empty and they are remodeling it. I just figured if anything would have happened to it by now when I wrote this article that it would have been, you know, a bunch of, uh, it would have been knocked down or something. But it's kind of neat how it gets remodeled. Oh, and something else I wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring up about, about the, the old signs and Memphis. When, I, I think what's interesting about local history for Memphis is for being such a big city, and I, I, I understand this for living in Austin for several years, is that you have a lot of natives or people who've lived here since childhood compared to a lot of other big cities. When I lived in Austin, it was kind of a novelty to have been, you know, to have actually been born and raised there. So many people were transplants, you know, with the university, state government, high tech, construction you know being big industries 
Memphis, you've got a lot of people. So, you know, I'm 52. If I talk about something that happened uh, in Memphis in 1981 to someone my age, a lot of people, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. But in Austin, you know, a 52-year-old say, oh, do you remember the the 1981 floods? People are like, oh, no, I wasn't living. I was living in California then or something. So I think Memphis is unique for, you know, small cities, yes, but for a big metro area, having so many natives or so many people who've lived here for so long, I think that that's that's one thing that you have with local history here, different from a lot of other cities. And some uh, some history maven from, uh, and I did like, like local history when I lived in Austin, some, some history maven from uh, one of these fast-growing cities like Austin or Seattle is probably rolling their eyes right now at me. But uh, that's I have nothing to base that on other than just anecdotal. They're probably not listening to this anyway because it's a Memphis podcast. Uh, you, so. <laughs> you never know about pot. I mean, you never know about the you internet. Know, some, some people do listen who aren't in Memphis or even haven't been here for sure. We've heard that, which is thrilling, especially when they're like, "Now I want to come and like explore." I yes. love that. Given what you just said about still having like people around who know the history, do you have any feelings about preserving things like ghost signs or anything like that? Like, is it also important to have the physical presence of history? That, that's interesting. And there are things that I, I really like how they've kept a lot of history. I remember in the seventies, yeah, you know, the cupboard restaurant, there used to be this big old store, you know, stone mansion from like the late 1800s there, it was knocked down and turned into a fast food restaurant. And some people will say that's when people start getting interested in preserving the past. I love the fact that the the Sears building is in a bat or, you know, is now Crosstown Concourse, isn't a bat roost forever. Or, you know, we almost lost the Peabody. And, and believe it or not, hardly anybody remember, I, I remembered hearing something about it and I researched it. Even Riverside Drive, you notice I-55 kind of stops at the, uh, the old bridge and then starts up. I mean, South Main was almost turned into an interstate in the 70s. Of course, everyone remembers Overton Park, or everybody who was around that time. That it, It's a shame that a lot of this stuff does go away. Memphis has been, it, it, it's kept a lot of stuff. It's had atrocities done to it in the name of urban renewal. I'll be the first to admit that. Or it's not perfect, but the physical presence it it kind of it kind of makes us us, and and I don't like something just because it's old. It, it's if something is just beyond repair. I mean, I'm a photographer. I I love shooting these old, rundown buildings. But there's a point where you know what is this? It's just it's just a hazard, it's an eyesore, you know, you could have crime enter into this old building, like the place at Union and McLean. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to miss that thing getting torn down, or the place at Pauline and Madison. Some historic purist may not like me saying this, but it's no loss if they put some TNT in the basement and knock that thing down and put something there. I, I still think it makes us who we are when you walk past these old buildings and maybe it's been repurposed. Nothing's ever going to be exactly the same. When Beale Street was kind of reopened in 83, some of the longtime people say, gee, it's not the same Beale Street that I remember from the from the 30s. And it's like, well, yeah, it's not the 30s anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like things that are kind of repurposed and repurposed well uh and and there's other little things that you have in memphis that are you know these little physical reminders of you know days gone by that they just haven't been restored there's a there's a story i heard i took the haunted memphis tour a year ago there's a place called the Broom Closet, which sells kind of uh, witchcraft and uh, sort of new agey thing. And is that a 90s term, new agey? But the kind of uh, gifts and sort of the Wiccan type thing. And there's a floor, there's a spot on the floor. Have you heard this story? No, I want to hear it. It's damaged. <laughs> 
and you, you really aren't sure what's there and the story goes and this much is true at that at that place a uh, police officer in 1918 Edward Broadfoot goes in there to investigate something and guys pull up they shoot him dead and that the blood soaked through the floor and that the floor is still damaged I mean it's very macabre but it's like I mean you're not gonna find that at Wolf Chase Mall <laughs> No. <laughs> Wait, so is it still, what is it now? It's it's called the Broom Closet, and they do the ghost tours. It was just some other kind of store back when the thing happened, yes. when the shooting happened, though. Okay, right. Okay, it okay. was, I think it was like a, it was, I think like a little cafe, if I remember correctly. And I'm also intrigued by the places that there's really not a historic marker. And, and I like, I, I like historic markers in Memphis, except for one, and I'll get into that later. Um, Ooh, but can't wait. I uh, love this. Okay. But <laughs> it's, there are places that really don't have historic markers. They have interesting stories. I've got some on my website. You know, everybody knows where Jerry, where uh, Elvis moved when he got popular. And, you know, there's a place down in Whitehaven. It's just a home, not too fancy, but that's where Jerry Lee Lewis moved. Most people don't know that. Or, oh, yeah. There's a, a home on Morningside back in 09, and Steve Jobs st- secretly lived there when he was getting his liver transplant. And there's uh, out on the hike bike trail in, near Shelby Farms is uh, there's this big old industrial plant, and that's where in 1982 that's where the Vietnam Memorial was was carved. Whoa! A lot of people don't know, and these are there's you not historic no markers idea. there. What is it? There's this rundown garage up in uh, on National. It used to be a Steverson, or not a Steverson. It was a Big Star, and there was a recording studio there. It, Big Star was a chain of supermarkets. I used to get Sunday lunch from there in Oxford, Mississippi. Yes. When I was in college, we would go because you could get it was real cheap for the like mm-hmm. meeting three. At the back of the store. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the, uh, in 1971, uh, Alex Chilton and his friends, they were recording. They hadn't come up with the name of their band, and they stepped outside to smoke a joint, and they saw this big star supermarket. And they said, hey, there it is. You know, it's like that's – it's a most run-down-looking place you can imagine now. It's My apologies that the owners are listening, but it's not one of the more attractive places in Memphis. And it's just – you know, it's just got an interesting little story behind about it, you know, and it's not going to be on any markers. Oh, and the, the, yeah. one, the one historic marker I don't like, and again, I, I love historic plaques. I'm a plaque kind of person. It's nothing political. It's nothing, you know, stirring up racial race or anything. It's just called Movie Making in Memphis. It's right at the arcade. It's in the middle of the sidewalk. So if they want to film a movie there, they're going to have, they've got this big plaque in the way you know <laughs> you're gonna have a couple walk down the sidewalks you know holding hands and then wait a minute then they have to <laughs> release their hands and then because there's a movie making in memphis <laughs> sign right in the middle of it oh that is yeah. funny i never thought about that one being in the way of actually making the movies but that makes a lot of sense <laughs> they're gonna just put it on a wall i mean i'm not no no I respect what the film commission does and everything, but it was just... Oh, that's funny. funny. Like, I guess they're like, oh, they can fix it in post. Yeah, it's maybe that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. With uh... But it's not easy. <laughs> oh, that's funny. If people who are listening to this are interested in finding ghost signs, learning more about them, I know you've already, by explaining your process of research, you've already given a lot of tips so maybe from just the exploring side, we'll just take Memphis, for example. Anyone outside of Memphis can, you know, use these tips for their own city. But how would you recommend you get started? How do you keep your curiosity alive as you go exploring? What areas would you recommend they explore? I don't know. However you want to take that. But like if I came to you and said, I really want to start getting into ghost signs, what would you tell me? <laughs> First of all, just really look at what you're curious about. I live in Cooper Young in a house that was, the paperwork says was built in 1900. 
and I mean I went through all the city directories and it first shows up in the 1913 city directory so what what's on the county website the assessor's website isn't always gospel and w would I have been that interested if it was anybody else's house uh, no not really so you know kind of find out what you're interested in you, your own neighborhood is probably more interesting than my neighborhood or someone else's some of the old air older areas that have been just kind of neglected uh, over the years you know they, they a lot of times they have old signs because nobody has really came you know come in and replace them there's a shopping center on south third which is kind of uh you know it, not, it's not really on people's destination list other than people in the neighborhood and apparently one time it was a big deal because you had the jackson five play there when in the 1970s at this shopping center the overall like, like third and bells my apologies wow. to my friends from that neighborhood you know the, the whole shopping center it's Mem memphis isn't like a lot of cities that have where something is closed down and they just knock it down immediately and put something new if something is kind of has sort of benign neglect like i mentioned the firestone the old firestone neighborhood there's going to be old signs there there's going to be little grocery stores that you know close down really just kind of look what you're interested in and sort of follow your your own nose in fact i just heard about a, a store this is nowhere near memphis but my, my name is Graney, G-R-E-A-N-E-Y, and I'm known for the longest time. There's this little community out in the middle of Nowheresville in Minnesota called Graney. And, oh. and back in 09, I went up there to just to see what was there. It was like a store <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, some old houses. And it was, I just wrote recently if it was still open because I'd found out the owner had died and it had closed down. And, you know, that's like a little piece that it, it's, I can't imagine how anybody could make a go out of it because it's just a very rural area between Hibbing and International Falls, Minnesota. And it looked like time stopped sometime around the Johnson administration there. And I just can't imagine that place will ever be open again. I'm glad I took pictures of it and I found it interesting. And I mean, if you see a sign that's interesting, you know, get out your camera, you know, everybody's got a camera with them now to the chagrin of us old photojournalism majors. <laughs> and, you know, shoot pictures look at the address there's also some of the old buildings on south main they have cornerstones with the date put into them so just kind of keep poking around yes if it's something that's you know if it interests you i mean i try to i try to do kind of a cross section of a bunch of different places you know i don't want to make it all south main i didn't want to make it all you know north memphis i try to do a, a variety of places but if i lived in south maine i'd be interested in that old coca-cola sign it's in the alley kind of behind the arcade if i lived in north memphis or kind of like south in millington there's an old woodstock drive through on 51 south of fight road and i'm my full-time job I'm an emergency medical technician and I pass that place hundreds of times on the ambulance and, I, and I've never researched it if I lived up north you know I'd be curious as to how long it's there and you know Memphis has a lot of longtime residents you know for again for being such a big city and ask around a few people who might know it I'll say Rebecca and I definitely had that experience working on the book is that even some of the signs we thought we got to kill this chapter, like there's nothing we can even find. It would turn out we would uncover the most interesting little stories. And once you get that first little piece, it's like it kind of can open the doors to seeing how this sign or this business of the past really fit into the landscape of that neighborhood and the city and on and on, you know? Yes. And, and you know, here's another thing I just thought of. I said, well, such and such story wasn't that interesting. You know, it probably is going to be interesting for somebody like the family that um, I, I found one ne over by Elmwood Cemetery, which is one of kind of one of my favorite history geek spots in town, is Abraham's uh, Grocery. And, you know, I, I 
did a, I did some research on it and like one of the one of the ancestors made a little comment on high ground news that said, oh yeah that's my family you know that was that was really cool or I mentioned that a, a liquor store sign across from the commercial appeal on Union and it was like oh how boring is this but you know the, I'm sure the family that that owned it for years and years they, they would find it interesting so what I find boring you might find interesting and vice versa. Yeah, that's a really good point. Here's a uh, less serious question, mm -hmm. but possibly a difficult one. I'm not sure. If you were being forced to paint over a ghost sign in Memphis, which one would you choose to cover up? Huh, let's see. Well, I bet somebody somebody's going to say that they know of probably some sign somewhere that has a black entrance, white entrance. Believe me, I... I I, I would have I would love to have found something like that, but I haven't. Even that I would want to keep up because there's something interesting to it. I think more in terms there are some buildings that I think if it could be replaced with something better, there's nothing really interesting to me about the building at Camilla and Madison. It's just it was an old hotel. It's been empty. They're not going to do anything with it. I'd be fine if that were to get knocked down. There's some interesting old buildings, like the Derman building. I would like to see that repurposed. But in the Steric building, I've looked and I've heard different stories as to when that emptied. I'm going to get ringed over the coals from history people. But if it's just going to be stay as it is for the next 50 years, I'd, I'd be fine if it was replaced with something else. I'm probably going to get all defriended by a bunch of my history buddies on Facebook. I think you might. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's a bat We're roost. veering into dangerous territory here. I Ooh. know. I'm like a heretic in the Middle Ages or something like that. But in terms of a specific sign, I really can't think of one. And, you know, some of them that I've seen that have been painted over really haven't been that big a, a law. You know, if it's something that's really not that old. Is it going to be sad if the old shoe carnival sign gets knocked down out on Winchester? Not really. I hope it, you know, something moves in there and it employs the people in the neighborhood and good place for them to shop and helps bring back... Uh, you know, more retail and more jobs to Hickory Hill. I, I guess you could say maybe something like that might be something good to paint over if something can be repurposed to something better. I'll, I'll give you that, mostly because I think you're going to get in a lot of trouble when this episode ends. With so the I'm Steric gonna building? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to let you off easy on that question. All right, if there was a ghost sign you could bring back, which one would it be? Oh, wow. Just one. There was. There's a sign on North Main... It's kind of encased in glass because some residents moved in there. It has the steps, but it had like this old advertising, and I wish I'd gotten pictures of it. You know, you could see like a shirt collar from like a hundred years ago. I, I wish that was a little more visible than it was. Of course, the residents could probably see it better, and they could, you know, go inside, and the sun prob and elements probably would have. Uh, eroded it in any way it's amazing when you think memphis probably doesn't you, you, i don't think probably has the best conditions for preserving these signs i mean when you think about it we have high humidity we have i think it's 55 inches of rain per year you know the elements that these signs have gone through for the last what is it um 20 50 100 years it's amazing that they that they hold up as as well as some of them do i don't want to be somebody stuck in the past but you know i'm as much as i like history you got to admire some of the resilience of these signs is it did i get off the topic here no, that's great. Okay, and I'm yeah. thinking about ghost signs and ghosts sticking around. And <laughs> um, I have one more just fun question for you. Okay. If there was a ghost sign that described you, what would it say? Or if that's too difficult, if there's a ghost sign in town, like best fits you, which one is it? I don't know. This is one of those things like, what is your spirit animal or something? Yeah. yeah I don't know. <laughs> I, nothing, nothing is coming out at me. I'm, 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 if somebody is a little more creative than I am, my my brother. Maybe if I rephrase it, if you were a Memphis ghost sign, which one would you be? Probably the older, the better, and lots kind of, with sort of very old typography where you just kind of get a sense of it. Maybe that old Coca Cola sign I saw on the alley. I, I, I like that one. 
It also reminds me I drink too many soft drinks and I need to lose <laughs> some weight. But I, I think that it, it's something about the typography. You could tell it's for real. It's not something designed just to look old. And I really haven't researched. I haven't re- really researched it that much. All right. Well, is there anything else about um, ghost signs or Memphis history or anything else that you like to tell us about before we sign off here? Just that I'm. I really like finding these little hidden gems. I like seeing the. You know, not only the just the sign itself and knowing it's old and kind of getting a sense of what it must have been like. I mean, you, you see pictures and everything like that of what it was like a um, hundred years ago and. You know, just trying to imagine daily life back then. And a sign, they would just walk past and didn't think much about it. And who would have dreamed that uh, if they could jettison a uh, hundred years in the future, there'd be a couple people on this thing called a podcast <laughs> the, talking about these signs that they're, that they're used to. That's the most interesting because you're even talking about the shoe carnival sign and, you know, it wouldn't be too bad if that's gone. But I was like, if it's still there in a hundred years, would people even know... Well, if you just go by there, like, what would you imagine a shoe carnival was? <laughs> in the early days, things were built more to last. And, mm. you know, it's somebody is building a, a Wendy's. They're not expecting it to be around in 50 years, much less 100 years. It, it's just kind of a lost art, uh, building things to last. I guarantee you. You know, if you and I could time travel to Memphis in 2117, you know, there'd be some possibility that the Steric building was there. But believe me, I'll, I'd buy you lunch, whatever's the most, the nicest place is, if Shoe Carnival is still up there with its, with its ghost sign in a hundred years. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it won't be. Well, tell everybody again where they can find you for more Memphis history, more ghost signs, more explorations. I'm at devongrainy.com, and I've got a little section with history. I, I, I've got a bunch of, you know, different local histories and, a, you know, a little bit of Tennessee and a little bit of Austin on there. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm, I'm also on Facebook, and there's a few good Facebook discussion posts uh, out there as well. Uh, you can find with, you know, a lot, a lot of people who really are interested in local history. And uh, for show notes... Head over to memphistypehistory.com slash ghost. And we will also have all those links that Devin mentioned, as well as everything else we talked about, so that you can keep looking into everything ghost signs and everything Memphis history we discussed. So this has been Memphis Type History, the podcast. And we like your type. You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. Find more Memphis Type History on our blog at memphistypehistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. 